Action Podcast. Hey, with Axel Schumacher and Daryl Baker. Coffee time. Na, let's see. Now, look how many options there are. Did you know that many coffee companies offer their customers applications that come with lots of different features? Here, look at this. You can choose how much coffee you want and at what time. Then the AI unit in the app calculates how the machine best adds beans and water in exact ratios to create a perfect cup of coffee for you. Of course, then the app sends back data regarding your buying habits and preferences to make more money. Think about it. Artificial intelligence is really rooted deep in our lives now, changing the ways of our living. I mean, AI can dramatically improve the efficiencies of our workplaces and can augment the work humans can do. AI is everywhere now. Social media, digital assistants, self-driving cars, email bots, web searching, online store, healthcare. Everywhere. Healthcare is actually a good use case. AI algorithms will enable doctors and hospitals to better analyze data and customize their healthcare to the genes, environment and lifestyle of each patient. And that said, AI can also be used to increasingly concentrate wealth and power, leaving many people behind. What about a destructive superintelligence? An AI general intelligence that's created by us and escapes our control to wreak havoc? Will we lose our jobs to robots? And what about our social media bubbles that are forced on us by AI and the big corporations behind these algorithms? I think if we use AI properly, the greatest blessings of mankind are within our reach. But how to do that practically? What will human AI technology co-evolution look like? And how will quantum computing play into this? I have to discuss this with someone who knows about AI more than almost anybody else. Yeah, let's sit down and uh, have a chat with a good old friend, Dr. Ben Gertzel, transhumanist, mathematician and one of the world's foremost experts in artificial general intelligence. He has decades of experience applying AI to really practical solutions in areas ranging from natural language processing and data mining to robotics, video gaming, aging, national security, COVID-19 and bioinformatics. Ben is also the founder and CEO of SingularityNet, a blockchain-based AI marketplace and chairman of the OpenCock Foundation, a project that aims to build an open source artificial intelligence framework. That will be fun. So welcome, welcome. Hi Ben, how are you doing? Hey Axel, I, I'm 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 great. I'm great. I'm in, 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 enjoying the uh, beautiful uh, Seattle winter weather and getting getting lots of AI development done. Wow. <laughs> great. So so where are you social distancing? So yeah, I'm I'm living on a, a small island in the Puget Sound off the coast of, of Seattle. So it's, wow. it's been a so big change from my lifestyle of previous years where I was like the last few years I've been more than half the time sort of on the road fly, fly, flying around to different events and to meet with the uh, Singularity Net's global re global research team. So I I often felt like Hong Kong where I was living was like a big airport lounge, right? So <laughs> now now I've been well, it is. Yeah, now I've been mostly in in one place uh, since since March, but I uh, no, it's been pretty good for getting uh, technical work done. So it's uh, there, there's pluses and minuses to everything. So yeah, that's that's advantage of a pandemic. So finally, work gets done, right? So you don't yeah. have to 
yeah. fly around the planet anymore, talk to people you don't want to talk to. <laughs> well, but I, I, I mean, I, I, I've been planning to spend much of this year in St. Petersburg, where our biggest AI development team is. And so that's kind of a bummer not to be sort of face to face with, with them. Actually, you can get into Russia now, so I can do it, but I, I'm sort of a... Yeah. I'm sort I've, of uh, I, I mentioned that before because family. because yeah. I have very very good friends in St. Petersburg, so we should go there together. Mm -hmm. So for the listeners of the podcast, so so Ben and I, so we, we we know each other for quite some time, and we started to work working together, and we have lots lots of things in common. So that's so that's I'm so happy to have you on my podcast. And uh, yeah, but jumping right back in, so you were mentioning Singularity Net. So I think most of our listeners probably have no idea what that is, although they should, I think, because it's a must, I think. So they we, should we, act. So come on. <laughs> yeah, so we, no, we, we started to, to, to work together. So with, with, with my company, Shivom and, and your Singularity Net. So explain a little bit what Singularity Net is all about. Absolutely. So, yeah, my background is really from artificial intelligence. I have a PhD in, in mathematics and I've been doing AI research and development for 30 plus years, including including uh, a lot of research on general intelligence and like building real thinking machines. So, I mean, I introduced the term and concept of AGI, artificial general intelligence, 15, 20 years ago, and been applying AI in a lot of areas, including, as you know, bioinformatics, which is where, where my work has touched, touched uh, Shiva, Shivam significantly. So, you know, when you're looking at artificial intelligence and what it's achieved and, and where it's going, there's many different aspects that are important. I mean, one is sort of what are the algorithms of, of, of thinking and reasoning and, and learning, which is where I spend most of my research time. But then another important issue is, you know, how is the AI controlled how is it how is it deployed like as as ai starts to become a real factor in the global economy and and starts to have a huge practical impact in 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 every domain including biomedicine and you know surveillance technologies finance uh, social media across the board like who is controlling who is who is owning this ai how is it all how is it all regulated and you know, for those of us who are sort of uh, anarchist or anarcho-libertarian in, uh, in orientation and mistrustful of authoritarian organizations like big governments and, and big companies, I mean, we would like to see AI controlled in a decentralized and participatory way and so how, how does it a, work with this uh yeah so this is a complex problem with many aspects right and there's certainly there's a social and cultural aspect which is important but there's also a technology aspect which is needed to enable the social and cultural aspects to to work to maintain a decentralized control of an ai network and singularity net is a project we founded in 2017 which uses blockchain technology to create a decentralized network of AI agents that that sort of cooperate together and collaboratively regulate themselves without any centralized controller or, or owner for the for the network. And so we we built this on Ethereum blockchain initially. We're now we're now diversifying a bit and we're going to move a bunch of the singularity network onto Cardano blockchain, which in some ways has a, has a, a more advanced tech stack. But um, I mean, overall, the idea is, you know, anyone should be able to create an AI, put it out there on, on the internet, let it broadcast to the other AIs. Well, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm, I'm in the, in the global AI network. Right. And, and, and then the, the network as a whole can regulate itself. Meaning when someone new comes in the network, everyone knows when someone leaves, everyone knows if a, a customer or an AI needs something done, it puts out a peer to peer request into the decentralized network and, and you find out who can, who can fulfill it. And then if a problem is better solved by multiple AIs 
collaborating together to get stuff done. The AIs themselves can figure out how to join forces and, 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 and get the thing done. And so we built sort of the plumbing and machinery that allows that using Singularity Net now. And now, we're, now I mean, we're engaged with scaling it up more with, um, and with then applying it to various different vertical markets, in, 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 including uh, on the you know, clinical medicine, healthcare robotics and, and bioinformatics side. Do you think this will, this will speed up certain areas in, in science like, like bioinformatics or the, the, all the big data in healthcare? Because um, usually when, at least in the early stages of, of development of AI, um, the algorithms, we usually had the problem that they had, we are only good in very specific tasks, right? So they could do A good, but they were horrible in B. And like so the famous examples, like like um, chess, new chess algorithms that are boosted by by AI, and then they're doing very good in, in chess, but they are they would be horrible in diagnosing diabetes. So, and then this is, I think, also a little bit where your work comes in, right? So, to bring this together. Yeah. So I I, I think. Uh... There's a number of different points wrapped up in your question there. So, I mean, in terms of creating AI that is more general purpose and it has the ability to generalize further beyond its experience and training data and to understand the context in which it's, it's operating, I think there's some fundamental sort of algorithmic and, and knowledge representation and meta representation issues. Like there's some hard AI computer science involved there, which we're working on in a project called True AGI, which is a, it's a spinoff of, of Singularity Net and it builds on the OpenCom project we've been working on a long time. So I, I think part of it is just getting the AI right. But then as you're doing that, you need to scale up in a very big way. And Singularity Net gives a decentralized way to scale up systems like that, which is a contrast to the centralized way that say a Google, a Facebook or a Tencent has scaled up their AI. So I think Singularity Net gives the needed tools for scaling up an AGI system in a decentralized way but it's not magic. Like you still need the right AGI algorithms and singularity net actually can be used to scale up AGI algorithms, or it can be used to scale up narrow AI algorithms that are more domain specific and also to sort of experiment with the, the, the boundary area between those like narrow AGI where AI, AI is getting, getting more and more, more general. And I think having a, a playground like that, is is going to be going to be fantastic. Quite, quite important. I, I love the idea, but but I think um, like from from someone who's not an AI expert um, himself, like is the whole system really also driven by big data? So does it does the system need as much data as it can get to to improve itself? Or um, you can't quite say that. But when, when you're dealing with large amounts of data in AI. I guess you need to distinguish between big data, humongous data, and super mega stupendously humongous data or something, right? Because you, right. I mean, I think AI does need a lot of data, but yet some AI algorithms now are consuming even more data than, than really should be required because their algorithms aren't smart enough. And natural language processing is an interesting example there. I mean, you have GPT-3, which has become a very famous NLP algorithm, although really there are no significant innovations inside GPT-3. The core mm -hmm. ideas are all there from like Google's BERT, BERT model from, from 2018 or whatever. But GPT-3, they trained the transformer neural net on insanely huge, like basically the whole web an insanely huge amount of, of, of data. They got an AI model, like a neural net with something like 170 billion parameters in it. And so you're looking at, you know, is all of Wikipedia enough training data or do you need the whole web, right? So my, my feeling is if you have an AGI algorithm that can really 
abstract and generalized from its knowledge, like all of Wikipedia should be enough. Like you don't, you don't, you don't need the whole web, right? So it's right. still, it's still big data, right? You, you're still needing to feed the AI a lot of data, but on but the it's other still a hand, computation problem, right? So I mean, it it, it is. But I, I guess my point is, big tech companies are taking that even to an extreme that's unnecessary, and they're doing it on purpose. Because if you make an AI that needs, you know, a billion dollars of compute power and the whole web, then the big tech companies and a few big governments are the only ones who can do it. So I think there's a dynamic where AI development is being directed toward approaches that require the resources only big tech companies have and directed away from, from approaches that don't require those, those resources. So the whole AI research field is being pushed in a direction that accentuates the differential advantage of big, of big tech companies, right? And so that's, that's perverse and most people don't understand it, but the leaders of big tech companies de definitely understand it, right? And so you, the thing is you do need a lot of data, but you don't need as much data as the big tech companies are, are, are deploying. And you, you can see... In, in biology, you can you can see the impact this this has also because in biology, while you have a lot of data, it's not the whole web, right? So like we're doing some work on, say, clinical trial analytics in, in, in the breast cancer domain, and you know you have gene expression data on thousands of people, and on the one hand, that's a lot of data because I, I mean I mean you, you have you know, 20, 30,000 genes for, for each person. And, and I mean, each of them has an expression level. You have some epigenomic data, some clinical data. There's thousands of people. So, I mean, that's big data in a traditional sense. It's a lot of bits. On, on, on the other hand, it's not as big as the whole web. And it's also not enough data for you to use most of the commonly developed AI algorithms today in, in a productive way, because it, the issue is the big data is the wrong shape, right? Like you have only thousands of people, but you have you have millions of, of, of bits of data for, for about each person. So even even though it's big, it's not super humongous like like the whole web. And as a consequence, deep neural nets and their standard form are, are not not good at dealing with this problem, right? So in in it seems like for working toward AGI and for delivering value in a whole lot of application areas of, of, of which uh, biology and medicine is one. I mean, you're dealing with data that is big, but not yet at, at big big tech company scale. And this, uh, this is a distinction that means a lot if you're doing the work, because I mean, it's like, can we do this in a small cluster of machines or, or do we need tens of millions of dollars of machinery? But it's a sort of distinction that it, it's hard to convey to the average person who's not a not a tech geek, right? I think my input from this is on on the clinical side, where where you're dealing with clinical input and you're trying to infer and develop concepts uh, linked back to things like companion diagnostics, and then the wider part of where AI kicks into that is maybe on the on the wider questions of how do genotypes and phenotypes get sick. Um, and in the various ways that they do that and within daily population genome healthcare and how how can um, those concepts help in that respect and I think sometimes there's too much data as you say and and for the clinician that's dealing with his patient it, 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 it it's overwhelming sometimes and so to bring that messaging back down is 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 is, is really interesting and a, and, a, and a difficult thing to do to make the the complex in a, in a very simple way and and that's for a clinician to understand, let alone the patients themselves. Yeah, we, so we've been dealing with these challenges in our, our clinical data sort of precision medicine work. Mm. So like what, we're do, what we're doing there is, so we're looking at data from cancer clinical trials and we have patients who tried different therapies and had different levels of success with them. And then we wanna be able to predict from a combination of gene expression and other clinical indicators, hmm. just predict like which drug will work for that person for their cancer with, with the highest odds, right? And I mean, so biologists do this using clustering and various traditional methods. And so 
we found some interesting success there using a variety of methods. So, I mean, we use our OpenCog system, which has this whole bio knowledge graph and it can do some reasoning based on that. And we also use some neural nets. We use a neural net called uh, InfoGAN, which tries to like automatically learn the semantic representation of the data. So one question is like, how do you solve the problem? How do you make a recommendation that's meaningful of which medicine people should use? The other is like, how do you explain that to people or their physician? Because the, the methods that physicians favor are like, well, we have these three genes that are markers. And so we look at the expression drives of these three genes and we tell you which drug to try. And so we can get uh, significantly higher accuracy by looking at these semantic features that AI discovers that non-linearly combine the expression levels of a whole bunch of different genes. <clears throat> and then, so that's the reality of it. It makes total sense. Like most things in the body are not just one or two or three genes acting in isolation, but then how to explain that yeah. in what way you want to explain that to the physician or, or the patient is a, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a different problem, right? And you, what, what is being discovered gradually in the AI field is you can't, you can't force your AI algorithm to operate in an explainable way all the time. Like that just makes it too stupid. You have to- You probably don't even know how it works, right? The, the algorithm itself. So this is, I think- I mean, you can, you can do forensics if you really want to. Mm -hmm. Like you can, right. if you really want to know like, why did the AI make this judgment in this case? I mean, you can investigate and figure it out. It comes out to be a long, complicated story. Like, it, and, and it's hard, it's a research project. But, but then in the end, that these are only people like you who will probably yeah. understand this. Like, this is still right. useless so for a medical doctor, right? The conclusion you come to is that coming up with a simple approximate explanation of why the AI made a certain judgment in a certain case, like, that's a separate machine learning problem is the point so finding finding the prediction is one problem and then finding a simple approximate explanation of why the prediction was made is a that's a separate machine learning problem to find that explanation right and it's so right that, that's uh, that's the way you have to look at yeah. it but how how do we know that we can trust the ai and in, in its decision making like how do we know the AI is correct. Well, it, it's so golden rules, isn't something it? Something new, right? Yeah. What you need. Well, I mean, how, how do you know anyone is correct? I mean, how do you how do you <laughs> how, how do you know that we're all not just like brains brains in in, in a vat that are, are hallucinating this weird world, right? I mean, we're all going we're going by induction, and we're we're assuming that that to some extent past performance is probabilistically somewhat indicative of, of, of future results, right? So, right. I mean, if- But if the doctor you, has to, at, at least to a certain degree, trust the algorithm because he or she has- No, you, you, you don't have to trust the algorithm. You have, you have to trust, you have to trust that the data isn't fake and you have to trust whoever wrote the test suite. You don't right. have to know what the algorithm is. I mean, cause you, you're always, you're splitting data into in sample data and out of sample data, you're doing all your training on, on certain data. Then you have some different held out data that you use to test the algorithm. And if, if the results are good on this held out data that was never seen by the researchers or the algorithm, I mean, then you have, you have, a, you have a statistical basis, which in fact is more solid than your basis for believing most of what traditional medicine comes up with, which is is overfit and not and not using a valid methodology most 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 of the time. And well, I can, would argue that it's, it's still whatever algorithm you throw on the data, it's still probably um, more reasonable what a human being can come up with because of the in, complexity. In many cases, yeah. I mean, I I think again, it, the thing is, if you feed insufficient data into an algorithm it will just tell you like, I don't have the confidence to make a good prediction. If you feed insufficient data into a human, they may just bullshit themselves that they know what's going on and tell you, well, I have an MD, so you must listen mm. to me. And the, I mean, the, the AI doesn't yet have that particular sort of pathology. So, 
anyway, the, the, the point I was making about the testing methodology, you know, that ties back into the blockchain aspect, right? Because you could have an algorithm that you've never seen and you can have a data set that you have seen only in an encrypted form. So you've basically never seen, but if you know how the test framework works, now the evaluation methodology works, you should still have trust in what that algorithm says on data fulfilling certain properties yeah. because, because because you know how the in-sample, out-of-sample out testing routine worked, right? And I, I think that that may end up being important in in, in the medical space in, 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 the, in the sense that, uh, you know, you, you have a lot of privacy concerns around data. And of course, al algorithm algorithms, most of the people can't understand. So in, in the end, you're having to trust whoever wrote the encryption code and whoever built the testing framework, right? Yeah, because that, that, that goes into your, uh, your conversation about big government and big tech taking over because there's inherent bias. We've seen that recently. Uh, and so the- they're... Right, so, you, so we, if everything's open source though, what yeah. you're ultimately trusting is you're trusting the global open source community to yeah. audit the encryption and the machine learning testing framework code. Yeah. And so in, in the end, it's bottoming out on a decentralized community of largely well-meaning geeks, right? Yeah. And I mean, that right. that's what I meant in earlier in this conversation when I said, you know, decentralized control, yeah. it's a social and cultural thing but you need the right technology to channel the social and cultural but aspects. Because it does come down to the open source community in the end, but the community has to be auditing the right stuff. Mm. But where are we with encryption methods? Like, look, for example, here, if, if you're, look, the, the, the people who are only listening, they cannot see it. I have a watch here. This is a, actually a Russian watch. If you can see, this is was built after, uh, it was dedicated to the unique cryptographic machine Enigma, which was oh, yes. used for uh, encrypting the German correspondence in the in the years of the Second World War. Cool. And until the English came, um, oh. and they were they were they were uh, sunking a submarine, a, a, a Nazi submarine with an Enigma machine on it, and so they were able to uh, decode basically how it works. And uh, so this changed the whole way how the how the second world war turned out right um now we are at a at a very i think important moment in human history where we have another problem with with cryptography right and this is for example uh quantum computing mm -hmm. so what's what's your take in how how will quantum computing change the way for example healthcare data can be encrypted now just just last week um probably uh you, you read about it and a team of uh, Chinese scientists. So they, they claim to have developed the, the so far the most powerful quantum computer in the world, capable of performing at least like 100 trillion times faster than what the current, the best, fastest supercomputers can. can I mean, on very narrow and specific problems. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, I think there's a, there's a lot to be said there. So first on the, on the China versus the West aspect, it's worth remembering that, I mean, all the concepts of quantum computing and all the, the theory and all these ideas were developed over great length of time, primarily in, in US and, and to a lesser extent, West, Western Europe, right? I, I mean, so the, the, the depth of understanding and the, the breadth of the quantum computing community in the West very, very vastly exceeds what exists in, in, in China right now. And China being a more centralized government is good at throwing money into mm. sort of building big things. So, I mean, the supercomputer architecture was invented in, in US and that China built some big supercomputers. Now China has, they've built some faster quantum computers than, than the West has, which is really deploying money to build something big. I mean, so that that doesn't mean that China is ahead in quantum computing in some fundamental way. I mean, I mean, they have many, many brilliant quantum, quantum physicists and quantum computing scientists. I, I'm just pointing out that like 
being ahead in some benchmark is mm. not is not really well, indicative. It's probably irrelevant anyways in the historical. Yeah, I mean, it, it, sh it shows that they're in the game. And for a, a country that recently was a third world country, I mean, it's it's mm -hmm. it's cool that they're, that they're in the in the game, right? But I I, I think the yeah the, the balance of innovation in quantum computing is very much U.S. and Western Europe still, mm -hmm. and I think it's an incredibly important area of research and development. I mean, I think as far as I can tell it's still a moderately long way from like yielding practical deployed products of, of but we, of, we said the same years. about about ai right not not long time ago so i think if we i mean again as a, as a well, but there, 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 there's a there's a difference between software and hardware right yeah. so i mean i think when you're looking at something involving solving these hard problems at the intersection of physics and engineering and, and hardware design, I think it's, it's much less likely that some sudden innovation <clears throat> is going to make 10 years of progress happen, happen in one year. Like you don't, you, you never have seen that in the history of, of hardware. Like one, once someone gets some amazing innovation in the physics lab, it's just still a lot of years to instrument the industrial equipment and, and I actually Absolutely. work toward ro rolling that out, that out to, to market. So in software, software is a little different, right? Because if, because if someone has a breakthrough idea and demonstrates it in the lab, I mean, it, yeah, it could be a year before that is, is a product that's on, on everyone's phone or something. Right. And I, I think it's, I don't think you're going to speed up the like physics based nanoscale hardware no. development cycle that that much. So w while I'm a, a radical singularitarian optimist, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to stick to thinking that quantum computing is like seven to 10 years from becoming like a major commercial thing. Yeah. And then, but but that, then for, for once once it does, it's first going to be the form of highly specialized quantum computing machinery rather than initially like a quantum universal Turing machine. I mean, I think, mm -hmm. I think that will come, but that will then be another phase of development afterwards. I agree. I mean, usually in what, what we see in science, and we had the same problem in, in the genomics field is that of course, once a new technology develops, first there's a large hype in and what can be all done then? Like if you remember, so back in the end of the last century, so everyone said, okay, now we have genomic sequencing and within a few years we will, will cure cancer and everything will be done. And of course it takes much longer, but if you look at our, for, again, on our, our species perspective, like these are split seconds of our development. Yeah, in, the, in that species, sense, right? sure. And I think that the, the, the problem we have, the humans, we are horribly slow compared to how our technology develops and there are a lot of developments and uh, uh, where let's say the normal human being just cannot keep up the pace and uh, understand what's going on right on the other hand when i had my first son who was born in 1989 i had the idea to to raise him alongside a baby agi and you know he's now early 30s and doing his phd in in ai and automated theorem proving whereas our our, our, our AI still has not gotten toward general intelligence. So that, I mean, the, <clears throat> the human development did outpace the, the AGI development in that case. So now, now I've got a new baby, he's two, another baby on the way. So uh, maybe these ones, again, I'm, I'm an optimist. I'm, I'm thinking these ones will be the ones to grow up alongside the, alongside the AGI, right? So that, I mean, the, the point is, yeah, in a historical sense, of course, technology is developing insanely rapidly and humans are about the same as they were a thousand or 10,000 years ago, but still there's a certain rhythm to development in science and engineering. Mm. And you can see, I mean, just as the biologists creating the human genome project 
most of them who were telling the politicians cancer was going to be cured in 2001 probably knew they were lying and that they knew that actually what was happening is you know they're revolutionizing the field which is important but it's going to take a totally indeterminate amount of time to melt the practical rewards from human genome project. I mean, in, 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 in the same way, I mean, quantum computing, mm. it's revolutionary, right? And I mean, that's mm. gonna, that will revolutionize everything in the same way that computing in the internet did. And I mean, the engineers working on quantum computing, I mean, they, everyone, everyone knows it's, it's 10 years until you have the QPU in, in every server on, on, the, on the server farm. I guess from an AI view, there's a question whether AGI will be achieved first and that will help us solve quantum computing or quantum computing will be solved first and then that will provide the added computing firepower needed to make the breakthrough to AGI. So my, my thinking is, is is the former. I mean, I think we're going to make some major AGI breakthroughs. And then AIs that are good at automatic algorithm learning, they're going to figure out how to make many, many algorithms work on, on various quantum computing substrates. Because figuring out algorithms to run on quantum computers is very, very hard, right? I mean, it, it just, it contorts the human mind. I mean, even, even if you understand quantum mechanics and quantum computing and algorithms and AI very well, which I think I do. I mean, it's still, it's just tough, right? I mean, I mean it's, uh, you, you, it is, you're yeah. dealing with a lot of weird constraints and possibilities. And I think an AGI that had sensors and actuators at the quantum scale is going to be able to build a different intuition mm. rather to design quantum algorithms. And, and you're going to see a lot of breakthroughs on the quantum algorithmic side when AGIs or advanced proto AGIs are, are, are designing the algorithms, right? And that's uh, so when will that's you think, be amazing. When when will we see scientific publications published by computers? If you take say machine learning applied to genomics, like if if we wanted to, we could write a system now that would download genomic data sets from NCBI and so forth and apply machine learning algorithms to them and figure out when it had gotten the result of higher accuracy than what's in the published literature and then auto-generate a paper and, and submit it, right? Like that, there's nothing, there's nothing there that couldn't be done right now if somebody cared to, to do it. I mean, probably, Probably arguing back and forth with the referees could be automated now too, if 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 you if you wanted to, right? So uh, I, I mean, I mean in, I, in the I, end, it's about generating new knowledge and new information. Yeah. So, but I, I guess I think that's kind of an interesting question, but it's not, not a maximally interesting question. And the reason is that getting papers published doesn't require as much general intelligence as as people outside science might think. Like what well, once. Once you have sort of a recipe for a certain type of paper, you could probably write a narrow AI to do that. I mean, take mathematics as, as another example, right? I mean, you have automated theorem provers now. And there's, so I, I mean, of course, you could run an automated theorem prover to prove theorems. And then you could wrap that in paper, wrap those in papers and, and submit them. So, I mean, writing the introduction and knowing what references to include is a problem, but I don't, I don't think that's that hard of a problem if someone wanted to do it. So to me, the more, the more interesting question is when will an AI start making fundamental innovations, right? Like when, when, will, when will the AI come up with a new template for doing research, right? Like say, say applying machine learning to crunch genomics data to, to say, figure out genomic predictors of some phenotypic characteristic. Like that's the kind of paper no one was writing before the mid nineties, right? So someone came up with the idea, like let's apply machine learning to genomics data. Now that in a sense, wasn't that hard of an idea because of machine learning had been applied to other things, but there's a lot involved there, right? Like you have to, you have to do pre-processing of the data. You have to figure out what kind of, what kind of pre-processing to do. You have to figure out, you know, what metric is right for evaluating 
the quality of those results in, the, in that domain. So this, this is some innovation in, in sort of figuring out like, what is the research question we, we, sh we should be we should be asking, right? And th that when, when will the AI figure out how to do that? That's a different question, right? Because then the AI really needs, then the AI really needs deep general intelligence of a form that most, human, most humans don't have. I, I mean, I guess they're both interesting because if there was more attention put in to automating routine science, we would be getting more routine science done at a higher rate and also more human scientists will be freed up to work on non-routine science, which is, which, is, which is more imaginative, right? So I, I think there's very little resources, globally speaking, going into either of those things, right? right? I mean, because instead, pharmaceutical companies are spending all their resources on like, how do we take a drug that was already FDA approved and repurpose it for some other indication so that we don't have to go through all the clinical trials again, right? So I mean, the the vast bulk of resources, even within the percent of world resources that's being spent on medicine instead of like spying, killing and, and, and crooked gambling and so forth. I mean, even the small percent that's being spent on medicine is mostly being spent on very unimaginative sorts of medical research that are designed to work around regulatory government bottlenecks, right? So, I, I mean, so then there's almost no resources going into automating routine science, which would be semi-straightforward to do now. Like, I mean, easier than building Bing search engine or something, right? And uh, let alone into the AGI research side of it, which would lead to AIs that are able to make fundamental conceptual innovations. Hmm. I think sometimes when the, the, the data doesn't exist as well, so if we're, if we're trying to use the AI- Yeah, you gotta know what data, if, if you gotta it, know what data to gather, right? Yeah. And, and, and I'm thinking more if we're trying to find out how, how not a person or a population, but how a genome gets sick and, and how does that. And sometimes I think one of the areas that I'm interested in is, is ancient genome analysis, which is really hard to determine because they don't exist. And so the AI for me is, is, is a, this may go into the AGI side of things and QCOMP as well, where to infer a concept or infer how ancient genomes exist or what, how can we actually bring that information into that so that we can actually infer concepts of how genomes evolved and, and how that, that genomes changed over time and, and how, at what point did, did that variant get introduced into the genome or the gene itself and then propagated down into the population. And that could be, that could introduce some really interesting concepts of it could be not human, it could be some, millions or 10 millions of years ago when when that variant was introduced that caused your con particular condition now and it's that, that, that yeah that, i mean the the causal analysis <laughs> with this sort of historical genomic analysis is really really interesting and mm -hmm. that, that's something that's very buzzy in the ai field now so going beyond seeing what patterns are there to understanding what are the the causal processes un, 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 underneath and uh, yeah, doing that in an area where the data is big in some ways and not big enough in other ways. Th 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 this again pushes toward the 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 AG AGI problem, right? So yeah, that, that's very so. I mean, in, so in in the domain of longevity biology, which uh, Axel, which which we all have an interest in, so. I mean, as as one example of where we don't have data, like I, I became very interested for a while in the, the, the buildup of gunk in the extracellular matrix with, with, with aging, right? So you have extracellular matrix, like all, all, all the stuff in between your cells, and there's all these proteins in there. And as you get older, more and more of these proteins cross link. And so it becomes harder for signaling to happen between organs through the extracellular matrix. And if you, you know, we have we have chemical signaling through the extracellular matrix, but there's also mechanical signaling. Just like one protein bumps the other, bumps the other, bumps the other. And there's even papers on biophotonic signaling, like ultra weak photon emissions through the extracellular matrix. And so potentially you could cure that by 
using nanotechnology to design a little molecule to be molecular scissors that would go in there and like snip all the glucosapain and other molecules in the extracellular matrix so the cross-linking isn't isn't there and you know my, my friend uh, Christian Schaffmeister at Temple University has been thinking about this for a while he has these novel molecules that, that I think could be used to make the molecular scissors but you know we don't have we don't have data very much about what's actually happening with extracellular matrix. So you know that the, there's like 0.6 correlation between the contours in the extracellular matrix and the meridians in acupuncture theory, which is which is 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 quite quite funky, right? But so yeah, we don't have an AGI that's going to be as smart as Christian Schaffmeister and come up with the idea of nanotech designing spiral ligament molecules to make a molecular scissors to cut the glucosapain molecules to free up communication in the extracellular matrix, right? Like that's, that's lateral thinking. And, you know, an, AG, an AI could come up with that example now, but it would come up with a billion really stupid combinations along the way. And having the sense to know which crazy ideas are, have, are crazy, but yet have some plausible chance of working. I mean, that, that requires, mm -hmm. Mm. a fairly abstract yeah. and refined imaginative intuition. It's, it's also a way of pattern findings. Or, I mean, we, we see this in research all the time that we, we study a topic and we find something interesting we were not actually looking for, right? And, and, and but to recognize this, this is a difficult part. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's the point because the AI will discover too many patterns and it doesn't know which ones are intriguing and, and 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 which ones are just you know statistically significant patterns that are mm. are, not, are not are not gonna they're, they're 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 not they're not gonna lead you anywhere right so so yeah that's we're doing this sort of research in singularity net and in a bunch of uh, sort of allied projects that we've created. So, I mean, I mentioned True AGI, which is trying to solve the algorithmic problem of, of human level thinking, but we have a project called Rejuve, which is oriented specifically to longevity biology and to, to gathering data from people about their bodies and then crunching it using, using AI, machine learning, machine reasoning to figure out, you know, what, what makes some people live to a healthy old age and others not, how could you prolong life and cure age associated, age associated disease? I mean, we're, we're also launching an app to gather data from, from uh, people related to COVID so we can, we can understand, understand more about, about the related biology there and what makes some people more susceptible and not. I mean, cause it's, it's really the same AI, whether you're talking about, and the same biology to an extent, whether you're talking about Age associated disease or, or COVID, which is also an age associated disease in, 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 a, in a way. So, I mean, the decentralized AI is important there because you want each person to have sort of sovereignty and ownership and control and visibility into everything being done with their medical data. So, the blockchain basis for it <coughs> is, is important in, in, in that regard. And then the a AI is is critical for finding the <clears throat> the data patterns, but you know you're you're fighting not just against technical problems, but you're fighting there against the whole the whole uh, medical information complex, which wants to keep data siloed mm -hmm. and which wants to do analysis in in very simplistic ways that match the intuitions of uh, you know legacy thinking medical doctors rather than matching the complexity of the actual biological networks. I think that's that's one of the biggest problems we face in our healthcare systems. It's not, we do not have a technical problem to solve our uh, our diseases, to, to, to get healthier, to live longer. It's, it's the healthcare systems in itself that are the problem. It's, we are innovation averse in most countries. Sharing without sharing. That's a big, big, big problem. Yeah, it, it's, I mean, you can sort of see why it got that way, because I mean, it's, it's people's bodies that they're, they're, they're apparent, they don't want their body to be used for like weird uh, laboratory research pranks or, 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 or something. But, but that the conservatism that, that comes with that has then been 
exploited by various large e economic entities to create oligopolies that that stifle innovation. And that, that's, uh, I mean, if you look at like decentralized finance, which we're getting into with the Singularity DAO, another Singularity Net spinoff. I mean, look at look at that compared to medicine. I mean, the the you know the ability you have to innovate in the finance space is just astoundingly more than, than in, in the in the medical space and you know that should be the case in in some regards but the conservatism that comes from from you know the hippocratic oath and don't do any harm the conservative that come conservative that comes with that has propagated into areas where more innovation would not harm anyone but would rather be helping everyone but people are i mean a lot of people are simply also afraid of what will happen actually uh, with all these developments like no one can follow anymore well, well people are people are afraid that that bill gates will, will microchip them when they're covered yeah. yeah i mean this is this is i think this is this is what makes me always really sad to see these stories that um obviously there's a global decline in uh, in the trust in science and in the scientific method and uh, because there's a global decline in the decline in the trust of everything i mean yeah yeah but this is but this becomes dangerous because people are not able to um to uh, to look at data or look at yeah. different data sources and and finding out for themselves of what is actually um useful data and <laughs> does it make sense at yeah. all yeah so why 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 would you trust one source more than the other, right? And uh, I would I would teach my kids or I'm teaching my kids look think for yourself, right? Um, but for that you also have to understand to a certain degree the scientific method how it works. And yeah, yeah. Well, there's a there's an Elvis Costello song uh, from the '80s like a, I used to be disgusted, but now I try to be amused, right? <laughs> I yeah. mean. If uh, we just have to view all this as a reality TV show, and the, 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 these these are these are just uh, amusing threads in the plot, but no, I mean in, in seriousness, yeah, this this bottoms out to another decentralized AI problem, like most things ultimately seem to in, in the modern world, because it's it's the media which is is either causing or accentuating this this problem, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so there's there's the education system, which focuses on sort of rote learning and, and uh, accepting what you're told rather than on fundamental independent in investigation. Yeah. And, you know, both the scientific method and rigorous philosophical method and, and all the rest. And then there's the media, which, you know, due to the desire to just keep eyeballs clicking on certain sites it follows certain tropes which you'll mm. lead people away from rather than toward the truth and what one of those tropes is just you know i've written a bunch of journalistic articles myself and i they you always have to you know give one side then give the other side and and then the journalist is supposed to supposed to be ob ob objective but objective comes out to mean you appear that you're even-handed in in A versus not A. It, it doesn't it doesn't mean that you're actually trying to figure out what's bullshit and what and what isn't bullshit. So like you you have one scientist saying, well, no, Bill Gates isn't isn't microchipping us with our vaccines. For journalistic balance, you must have some other guys saying, yes, Bill Gates is trying to microchip with the vaccines, <laughs> and then 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 you have an, an equal equal balance, right? And that's just like yeah. with that with evolution, like. Okay, we have one guy saying evolution is real. For balance, you must have another guy saying the world was created six thousand years ago, right? So, I mean, you you have all these patterns that sort of emerged for their own reason that sort of made sense, but are now just polluting everyone's everyone's do you, mind. Do you think and there's a, a solution to that. I mean, it, it's obvious that we. Uh, like we had this all the time, right? So these dis discussions. So what what is true, and then now we have these alternative facts. And but once whole populations are affected by decision makings, yeah, who have not the knowledge or not even the the will to. It becomes people. quite subtle, right? Because I'm not Problem. I'm not a reductionist materialist at bottom. I don't think 
I don't personally believe there is an abs absolute truth. And I, I do to some extent buy the whole po postmodernist like collective construction of, of, of reality. Mm. On the other hand, that still doesn't mean you have to view all opinions as, as created equal. And it, there are some methods of collectively constructing a, a reality that have in some senses fundamentally better characteristics than others. And I mean, mm. the scientific community, the open source software development community, for all their weaknesses, which are very numerous, they're much better ways at arriving at a collectively un under understood truth than say Facebook or, 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 or Twitter or Weibo or something, right? So, yeah. I mean, and you could turn these social media networks into better mechanisms for channeling the collective social construction of, of, of realities. And I'm, I mean, blockchain provides tools for, for doing that which however are not being rolled out because of the economic structure of, the, of these industries, right? So, I mean, you, 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 we designed and prototyped in SingularityNet a reputation system, which provides a way to sort of, to let a community of people collectively determine which pieces of information have value in that community and to which segments of that community and to transparently see how these judgments are being made. So, I mean, you can, you rate things, you can rate other people's ratings, you can rate other people's ratings in, 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 in specific respects. And you can have machine learning algorithms that are transparently looking for reputation scam and fraud in, in that network and which are audited in the open source. I mean, this is not that hard compared to say, curing aging or creating AGI. The math is there, we've prototyped this thing, but mm -hmm. you know, how do you, how do you make it so that Facebook and Twitter are replaced by systems that use this sort of decentralized machine learning based reputation framework? I mean, that becomes an industry structure problem because if you, if you go to, I mean, Singularity Net is doing okay, but we don't have the resources to fund so many projects like this using our, using our AI, right? So how do you get, investors to fund something that's going to take on Facebook with a with a decentralized network right I mean it's uh do you think the break 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 the idea of breaking up Facebook that's been postulated recently is a good idea then just to sort of break down some of these uh monopolies that they have I mean uh, sure I, I think I think it's a good idea I think it doesn't solve the fundamental problem because no. if you have Facebook Instagram and WhatsApp as separate companies, they're probably all still going to be malevolent companies that yeah. that East they cooperate East together East in an ecosystem East to brainwash people's minds in a direction that's optimized to maximize shareholder value and advertising revenue. I mean, so you're <laughs> you're creating one malevolent actor with three <laughs> malevolent actors, and I, I mean that's uh, it's probably it's it probably is is better, but it's not mm. addressing the fundamental issue. So I think. I mean, if government wanted to make a, a positive impact, which obviously Trump doesn't, and I mean, the next administration, uh, who, who knows? I mean, I would be more optimistic if Andrew Yang had won the US presidential election, right? I mean, I mean, what, what the government could do is put massive development funding into democratic and decentralized social network alternatives, mm. right? So that entrepreneurs could then come up with amazing new ideas that, that are better than Facebook and TikTok. Like the, the problem with TikTok, which is really cool, the, but the problem with TikTok is not that the Chinese government created it. I don't really think the Chinese government is using it to, to spy on the preferences of, of American youth or something. I, I mean, they, they, they might be, but there's, there's, no, there's no evidence of that. And uh, the, the problem is that TikTok's recommendation algorithm, it's even more opaque than Facebook or, or, or Twitter. Like you just get the stream of little videos. You have no idea why you're seeing what, what, what you're seeing. You can't configure it. You can't choose anything. You just get this shit thr thrown at you. And their, their algorithm is doing all the thinking for you, right? So that's, that's, exactly in, in, in the wrong direction in terms of transparency and agency and, and 
democracy and, and, and decentralization, but it's becoming the number one thing for kids, right? For, t for, for, think, for teenagers. Think about, think about how, I mean, Facebook is, um, you ask the, the, the kids of today about Facebook and it's it's like your grandmother's kind of like application. Well, that's right, but but TikTok, is, e TikTok is even more malevolent in its use of AI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, I mean, I mean, it's not, it's not that the kids are moving on to something that gives them freedom and agency and mm -hmm. democracy. You have, yeah. I mean, you, you have, you have the freedom. I mean, it, it's, it's very interesting in a way in that mm -hmm. it's, I mean, kids are going on there and they're opening up their hearts and they're, they're being very transparent and showing, showing their, their lives to others. And it gives you a window into what people are doing all, all, all over the planet in a very up close and personal way. On the other hand, it's all orchestrated by an unseen algorithm, which is uh, adjusted by a company who, which has their own interest primarily in mind. Well, you and Bernie said that he, he, he when people were, were talking to him about uh, having their human genome sequenced, and he was saying, "Well, who cares? I, I, I can go on Facebook or I can, I can go on some social media app and, and pretty much determine more from that." Than I can do from sequencing somebody's genome at this moment in time. You can really dig into somebody's lifestyle. Well, that, that that is that is might be true for social behaviors. Yeah, it's certainly not true for medicine, right? Oh, like yeah, I, course, I could course, yeah. I, I could I could tell you what drug will cure your breast cancer better yeah, from yeah. your genome than from your Facebook profile. But yeah, if you look, on the other hand, if you have like if I'm on to estimate your IQ. If I have your genome and your Facebook posts, I'm going to do even more <laughs> accurately, and so the government will just accumulate both, right? I mean, it's 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 it's, it's not e it's not either or. So. so then we are back basically to to education, like um, for yeah. example, I, I yeah, yeah, yeah. will tell so, you like my my I have two daughters which are not uh -huh. teenagers, they are not on TikTok, yeah. And and because I I hope so that I could educate them about how social media work and they don't even want to be on TikTok, yeah. And but they have no mobile phones anyway, so that's uh, <laughs> that's a different story, no. <laughs> but um, but if Would the, they, the if problem I see is of course that um, we as as parents we of course lose ground so like we are not the prim primary educators anymore mm -hmm. this is now this is now facebook and instagram and tiktok that educate kids and then it's it's going on and on like this yeah i, I think we can see now with so many parents stuck trying to homeschool their kids we, we, we can see what a mistake was made in not developing for education ai for education instead of surveillance right uh, I, I mean you could have AI tutoring systems mm. that are, are working with kids and connecting kids with other kids who are at a similar point in their learning path and so forth. And, and it, it, instead, instead, we just have endless Zoom calls, which, which, which every, everybody's sick of, right? So, I, I mean, I, I think uh, there's a lot of positive value AI could be having for education now. But again, if AI was rolled out for education, in a sort of regimented top-down way, it's gonna become like a super efficient brainwashing tool mm. rather than something that 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 opens up new horizons and, and helps helps kids to to develop themselves in a, in, a, in a positive way. So you you want AI for education to be rolled out in a way that has decentralized control. And again, the world puts essentially no no resources into that, right? Like no 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 almost almost nobody cares. Almost nobody thinks about it. So and even now in the pandemic, it's not causing anyone to worry about it. So that's a that's a we have a very perverse resource allocation algorithm as a as a, as a species at at, at this <laughs> point in time. So where do you I mean, what we what we can do? I mean, you and I and others in our position, we can create tools and put them out there, right? So that these tools can be used to hopefully crystallize the right decentralized networks of, of humans around, 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 around the tools. And I think- But the tools need to be adopted. That's, I think, the big 
big challenge. Yeah, and th there's a chicken egg problem, right? Because you need a tool there to be adopted, and then you need adoption to drive the f the further ad advance advance of the tools. And of course, we're working on both. Like in SingularityNet, we have a pretty large community of of enthusiasts about about the the project, and so I mean we are we're reaching out and trying to raise consciousness at the same time as we're as we're building technologies but yeah you need to you need to break through to the to the mass audience and that's that's much easier to do if you're being sort of dishonest and uh, manipulative than if you're trying to be open transparent and 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 democratic right so i mean that's a, it's a major challenge because you 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 find in, indeed the technologies are are critical, but the social network dynamics are also critical and are guided themselves by some of the same technologies. So, like like everything in individual or collective human systems, it's all some horribly tangled up knot of of mixed up features. So Ben, so if you would recommend now a young person um, who is maybe interested in to going into science, um, in what direction would you recommend a young person should, should look for us so or to spend their time with that it's worthwhile? Is it going into solving these kinds of problems maybe? Social, social dynamics and, and AI or? Well, I think, so you know, the reason I did a PhD in math was I was interested in, in so many different things. And I, I couldn't pick, but I figured everything of any value has mathematics at, at its basis. So that, 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 that would be the core. If I learn math, then you could do AI or build time machines or spaceships or solve aging or whatever it is, there's going to be a math aspect to it. So I would say given, given the rapid change and volatility and everything about, about our world, the most important thing is to gain facility with general purpose tools, right? So, I mean, I'll, I'll come back. I mean, I think mathematics, computer programming and physics and uh, technical writing and communication, like th these are all incredibly general purpose tools. Like the, 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 those, are, those are useful everywhere. If you have a grounding in those, then, then then, 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 then you can then you can do anything. So I guess I'm, I'm coming back to my roots as as a mathematician there. But I, and I, yeah, I think there's so many different problems that you you could pick essentially any any niche of uh, of the global economy, and, and and you could you could find you could find value to add. Certainly, I mean one can point out specific problems right now that that are 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 needful of, of of attention right and i mean applying blockchain and machine learning to social networks is one i mean solving sort of the democratic data access problem in, in decentralized medicine is, is 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 one say speech to speech machine translation for languages without written resources, like most of the languages in, in Africa. I mean, that's more people should be working on that. I mean, you could run down a long list of things, but the thing is five years from now, some of these things will be solved. Some will look like different problems than, than they do right now, which is why you, you need to have the basic, basic tools. The other thing I'd say to someone young entering into this stuff is, the hardest thing for me to find right now as someone who's organizing and orchestrating a bunch of projects is people who can interface between the world of humans and, and the world of geek scientists and, 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 and technologists, actually. Because, I mean, I find it easier to find genius programmers, mathematicians, or biologists, say, than to find people who can translate between those geniuses mm -hmm. and the needs, requirements, and understandings of of ordinary people who are like users who, or who are investors or, or so forth. So, I mean, if you're a hardcore Uber geek, obviously go for it. I'm not going to stop you. Like just plunge into whatever area of technology you, you want to be obsessed with. But if, if you're not 
like by nature uh, an uber geek. I mean, if, if you can get yourself to the point of having a moderate understanding of some important areas of technology and you're able to communicate with other people, I mean, that, that's actually, it's a more rare and precious skill in, in, in some ways that, than the hardcore geek skills at, 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 at this point in time. But that's that intermediate role in, in is a lot of the bottleneck in, in moving things forward now. Yeah, but this requires putting work in. And I, I'm not yeah. sure if the people nowadays with the uh, decreasing times, uh, the, the well, this is an issue. Yeah, I, I, I find the, uh, yeah, there, there are, I mean, there are things, that, that there are things you cannot do in, in one minute increments, right? I mean, there, there are things that, so, I mean, for me personally, I spend half my work day like bouncing back and forth between little snippets of things, which uh, is sort of what coordinating different projects and, and doing communications is like. But then at some point, you got to sit there and spend like five hours just focused in on some incredibly difficult, highly technical problem. And if you're not able to carve that kind of focus out of your day and out of your mind, then then there's some kinds of fundamental progress you 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 can't make at this time when we're still relying on on human brains to make that progress, right? And it, it's true. Many people now don't get acculturated to bear down really hard in a focused way and sustained way on 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 hard problems, right? And but still, I mean, we've got a lot of. Uh, people like less than half my age on our team who are really good at doing that. So it, it's, it, it, it's, it's not hopeless by any means. No, but absolutely not. I, I think, um, especially, especially as scientists, I think we should be positive. I mean, we are doing this for a uh, purpose and not, not only because it's extremely interesting, but we can do so many things to really improve the status quo, right? Mm -hmm. um, people usually focus at first with new technologies at the problems. Yeah. And, but I think we should do exactly the opposite. We, we need to look at the opportunities and this makes this, the, the whole science field so fantastic. You know, that's a crazy thing. Like uh, there's so much research, everyone wants to mobilize to solve COVID. No one gives a shit about mobilizing to solve death, but like, guess what you have? It, you have a very low odds of actually dying of COVID if we don't do something radical, you have a very high odds of dying of old, of dying of old age, right? So I, I mean, is our is our ability to defer gratification that bad that that we can't see? Yes. That, yeah, I, I guess it is, right? Yes. I mean, like we, yes. I mean, we have we have the science, we have the technology, we have the passionate geeks who want to cure death. We have the resources sitting in, in accounts around the world, but yet as a species, we can't seem to mobilize ourselves to direct the resources sitting there to the people who want to solve the problem to enable them to work on, on curing death while still paying rent and, and, and putting a roof over their, over their head, right? It's, mm -hmm. So as a result of that, everyone will get old and die when they didn't have to. It's com com completely stupid. And COVID is a short enough time scale People were willing to allocate a lot of resources to developing mRNA vaccines, which was very cool. But if you think about it, like the, the energy that went into accelerating mRNA vaccine development and compressing, you know, multiple years of work on that in, into months. I mean, what if that energy went into curing aging? We, we could mm -hmm. reduce many years of work on curing aging in, into months, yeah. but we're not willing or able to put that sort of energy into, into, into curing aging, even yeah. though you know well, the, that's, the that's, 90 a, that's a classic and, problem like I mean, yeah like the 90 year old person 90 year old lady gets covid their chance of dying is still probably like 15 percent or something whereas that person is going to die very likely within the next five years or something without without covid anyway but we're putting very little but that, that was a mystery the other causes of death. my whole life when i when i see how, how governments spend money to see that there are, you just have to look at the list of why people die. Yeah, and then, then there's certain things where a lot of billions of, of, of dollars go into areas that's maybe at number 50 or 60. And yeah. but the, the main cause is number two, three, four. And 
nobody cares about this no? like that, that why why are not billions spent on figuring out why people consume so much sugar what to do about this like that everyone every second because American that, because gets that money was spent because the sugar industry spent billions of dollars on quasi fake research and public relations <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 uh, that's a central problem simple things like um, i mean i think this is probably the role of governments to figure this out yeah that they can decide look we have to spend money in this area because look that every every year there are 150,000 people dying in car accidents so how can we solve this problem um, it's probably not that difficult governments yeah. if they act to solve that okay yeah And well, that's a very that's a very European point of view. I think here in the yeah. US, we've figured out that governments are not going to solve that problem. So, yeah, I, I, I mean, uh, I, I think uh, you think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if any government solves it, it'll, it'll be the Chinese government. Actually, actually, I mean, I mean that that's. Uh, But that's because there the government is is everything. Like every big company is essentially is essentially a, br a branch of government. But yeah, I, I mean, government research funding certainly plays a role. I mean, the N NIH is a surprisingly functional organization in, in, in the U.S. Right? I, I mean, so th there there is there's certainly value coming from that sector, but yet. I think government is going to be more a follower than 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 a leader. I, I mean, mm -hmm. once once results are shown by a more decentralized networks, you know, grappling with these fundamental problems and solving them, perhaps the government can come in and, and follow. But for, for a, a lot of these big problems we're talking about, like curing aging or sort of un, unfucking social media. So it helps get toward interesting forms of truth rather than, than boring forms of deception. I mean, I, I don't think government is going to play a lead role in solving any of those problems but uh i mean within the yeah. uk at this moment in time it's all about uh enabling innovation innovators and in, in, innovation and, and that's as that's as best as i think we can do at this moment in time but it, an actual government taking control and doing that can be difficult i mean just to, just opening up the the systems themselves and the people within the governmental systems to sort of help out that's that's one thing Yeah, I, I mean, you, you never you never know, but uh, it seems the the structure of government is, for understandable reasons, the structure of Western democratic governments. They're sort of designed for conservatism, and that they're, they're designed not to be able to do anything too big too fast because you have all these different parties constraining each other, whereas technology and informal social networks are unfolding just at a, at a different speed, right? So, I mean, I, I think the solutions will come from the more rapidly moving parts of the, of the global brain. And then uh, if we're really lucky, the government will be able to adapt and not actively impede the solutions that, that, that come out of the rest of the, of the, of the ecosystem, right? Uh -huh. Right, right, right. So I, I, I speaking of uh, government projects, I, I have a meeting with it with a very interesting project shortly. So I, I, I'm going to have to disappear from this podcast. Right. Yeah, thank you so much. Anyways, it was fantastic. It's like always. And um, yeah, I hope we, we will see each other in, in person at some point. So maybe in some yeah yeah we, we should we'll hang out in person and i'm uh, i'm uh, as i as i mentioned to you in one of our private chats uh i'm thinking to actually launch a podcast myself to get together with a with one of my colleagues and, and close friends so if uh assuming we follow through with that with that plan it, it'll it'll be uh be fun to return return the favor and uh, in, in, in invite you as one of our guests yeah I'm, so can... i'm i'm sitting here in my tardis and i'm waiting for your call <laughs> yeah yeah Because uh, I mean, I'd like to. I'm aware as I'm as I'm holding forth here. I mean, you you've got your own deep thinking on the bi biomedicine and and blockchain and longevity and a whole bunch of these topics as well. So yeah, when uh, when we turn the tables, I I can dig dig into your own thinking on this stuff. Perfect, perfect. So thank you, and 
we always try to, to, to have a positive note at the end. So people, especially young, young uh, boys and girls, so learn, learn math, learn about AI, learn what you can do on positive things for the world. No? And fuck social media. So there's a lot of things to do. Breathe. Yeah, yeah. And so have, uh, you can look at singularitynet.ai, which is our, our, our website. And uh, there's a SingularityNet blog, which has various posts by me and others on, on, on related topics. And uh, yeah, I know a lot of people are depressed lately for obvious reasons, because COVID is just screwing with the rhythm of everyone's personal life. But uh, I, I think... Yeah, as Axel has said, there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic. I mean, we're, there are COVID vaccines, which means this particular issue is going to go away. And I think it will be great if rather than just partying in celebration that COVID is done, you know, after the vaccine is released and COVID becomes a non-issue for most people, after the partying is done, you know, it will be good if more people think about, like, how do we put our minds and our lives and our hearts into, you know, developing tools and systems so that future crises, which are probably going to be even worse than COVID, can be weathered, you know, far more, far more intelligently. I mean, the more we build beneficial decentralized technologies acro across every sector, the more we can weather whatever weird glitches, glitches come up f faster and in a way that, that, makes us all stronger r r r rather than, than causing ancillary issues. Right on. Perfect. Thank you so much. Great words. Right. To the end. Peace and love. Th thanks, Axel. Peace and love right. for everyone. Thank Bye -bye. you so much. Yeah. Take care. Ah, okay, so we are at the end of the podcast. Finally. So what did we learn when it comes to dealing with AI? Hmm? Who knows it? Do you remember? Oh, I will tell you. Mankind is affected not by events, but by the action we take on them. Yeah. <sighs> so I guess that's it. Podcast is over. <laughs> you can go now and uh, feed your dog. He's waiting there. And before you go, if you enjoyed the show, and uh, I hope you did, um, please leave a like. And please subscribe to the channel as well. And if you watch this on YouTube, press the bell icon. And, and so you will get all the updates to the podcasts. Okay, that's it. See you next time.